The Great Barrier Reef, or the GBR, is located on the northeastern continental shelf of Australia and is the largest contiguous reef system in the world. The GBR contains approximately 3,600 individual reefs, and estimates of its total size range from 250,000 to 349,000 square kilometers. Coral reef systems like the GBR are some of the most biologically diverse and productive ecosystems on the planet. The persistence of many organisms and ecological processes in coral reef systems depends on the high levels of structural complexity provided by the calcareous skeletons of coral species. The Great Barrier Reef provides vast numbers of people with ecological goods and services. Some have been quantified in monetary terms, and the value of others is less apparent in terms of dollar amounts. For example, the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park generates about $6.9 billion annually for Australia's economy, more than 85% of which is directly from the tourism industry. But it is much more complicated and difficult to hang price tags on other, more abstract services like existence and option values. Population declines in the Great Barrier Reef can be attributed to a number of factors, many of which are direct results of human activity. Direct anthropogenic stressors of the Great Barrier Reef include overharvesting, pollution of ocean water, and dredging. Ocean acidification and changes in carbon saturation states and annual sea surface temperatures may be linked to declines in coral cover and diversity in the Great Barrier Reef. When atmospheric carbon dioxide is absorbed by seawater, the pH of the water decreases, particularly in the upper layers. Laboratory studies have shown that coral calcification decreases with declining pH. Changes in annual sea surface temperature have also been documented to inhibit the capacity of coral species to calcify. Many corals grow by releasing aragonite into the space between their tissue and the skeletal surface which was previously deposited, and changes in the availability of aragonite can result in changes in coral cover and diversity. Crown of thorns starfish are a coral eating species which has made considerable contributions to declines in coral cover. The primary causes of crown of thorns starfish outbreaks has been subject to scientific controversy. Some researchers have postulated that these population outbreaks are a natural phenomenon. The opposing view maintains that crown of thorns starfish outbreaks are the result of anthropogenic changes in the environment. These hypotheses each rest on their own assumptions, and investigation into the causes of these events becomes increasingly important. Exactly how these factors affect the GBR and which contribute the most is unknown. What is clear is that reductions in biodiversity contribute to losses in resiliency, a connection which can be observed in ecosystems all over the world. The resilience of the Great Barrier Reef must be conserved in order to secure its capacity to supply human populations with ecological goods and services. Efforts to improve and maintain ecosystem health in the Great Barrier Reef need to include informed decision-making and timely execution before species declines become unmanageable. Fish caught from the reef represent about 10% of the fish consumed by humans. It's been estimated that one square kilometer of actively growing reef could be enough to support the protein intake of more than 300 people. Coral reefs protect coastlines from erosion due to currents, waves, and storms. When coastlines are impaired, the costs to society can be enormous. Coral reefs also build up land. Several nations of the Indian and Pacific Oceans with large human populations are on islands which were built by coral reefs. The GBR also physically creates the favorable conditions for seagrass growth and mangrove ecosystems. The skeletons of reef building corals can be used as long term chemical recorders of the levels of pollution and metals in seawater. The skeletal deposit layers of long lived large corals vary in density and width, and like tree rings, can be analyzed to determine previous environmental conditions. The Great Barrier Reef also creates lucrative recreational opportunities. Tourism in the GBR World Heritage Area was estimated to be valued at around $517 million as of 1994. 
The aesthetic values of the GBR are not easily quantified, but are reflected in countless photos, films, and paintings every year. The reef also sustains the livelihood of many local communities, and its status is especially important to people who rely on the reef for sustenance. The GBR hosts over 350 coral species, over 1,500 fish species, 4,000 mollusks, five species of turtle, and is a breeding site for over 250 different kinds of birds. Although the Great Barrier Reef only occupies about 0.1% of ocean surface area, it contains about 8% of the world's fish species. As new species are periodically discovered, estimates of diversity in the area continue to rise. While the GBR hosts an incredibly diverse range of corals, fish, and other organisms, a surprisingly small amount of individuals are truly unique to the area. No corals found within the boundaries of the reef can be classified as endemic. Despite this fact, eight fish species exist here and nowhere else. The implementation of no-take areas, or NTAs, has been the fallback option for GBR preservation. However, past efforts have failed in both area size and location designation. Designating specific regions of the GBR to tourism and others to preservation depends on the current and projected future status of that reef zone. Vulnerable or recovering ecosystems should be free of human interaction while thriving habitats can be unharmingly toured. Although diving and snorkeling expeditions on the Great Barrier Reef are growing in popularity and supporting local economy, tourism in the area should remain extremely mindful of the fragile nature of these ecosystems. This is known as ecotourism or the balance between supporting local economies and educating tourists on the nature of the area they're visiting. A benefit of NTAs is the fact that they do not prohibit aquatic recreational activities. Tourists may still dive and tour alongside an educated guide, even among protected areas. Both ecologic and economic goals are satisfied. As previously mentioned, an array of potential threats exist and do pose danger to the GBR. Cots outbreaks, coral bleaching, and total anthropogenic impacts are considered. Between 1982 and 1984, Crown of Thorns starfish decimated John Brewer Reef, an individual reef community within the GBR. In October of 1982, four cotton individuals were found to exist in the area per two minute tow period. Only 12 months later, tow results were turning up that reported over 100 fish per period. By January of 1984, they had all but disappeared from most of the reef, but the damage was already done. Cots precipitated, on average, an 85% loss in coral cover for the John Brewer Reef, with some areas experiencing a loss of nearly 95%. The early 1980s witnessed a record-breaking heat wave. Drastic temperature increases held negative implications for shallow water reefs as they are vulnerable to rapid warming. Warmer oceanic temperatures, as well as increased irradiance, have been linked to coral bleaching. In particular, the Java Sea, located in part of the Pacific, similar to the Great Barrier Reef, suffered 80-90% coral mortality during this warming event. The proximity and similarity of the Java Sea to the Great Barrier Reef implied the possibility of similar occurrences among the latter ecosystem. Aside from coral bleaching and the crown of thorn starfish, a variety of human-driven impacts pose threats that, when considered as a whole, become an even greater potential impact on the reef included our terrestrial runoff and, as previously discussed, ocean acidification. The former of these two impacts is specifically relevant to the Great Barrier Reef as the ecological zone resides off the coast of heavily populated areas. Terrestrial runoff refers to water pollution through accumulation of chemicals released into waterways through anthropogenic processes such as agriculture and urbanization. Its effects on marine wildlife are similar to those induced by ocean acidification decreased levels of coral calcification, and reduced biodiversity. Thankfully, recent acknowledgement of this potential issue has warranted the release of several regulations. These laws strictly limit practices that could indirectly release chemicals into waterways through precipitation runoff over impervious surfaces. It may seem as though the magnitude of each of the previously mentioned threats could be reduced through regulations in a bit of government effort. However, even in lieu of habitat and prisons, the sum of their impacts would still promote extreme reef vulnerability. The reason lies in the resilience of the coral itself. Historically, coral is able to recover and regenerate following major destructive events such as cyclones, disease, and crown of thorn outbreaks, albeit a large expenditure of energy. 
As this power is more readily used to counter pre-existing stress, the organism cannot expend nearly as much on self-repair and recovery. For example, take a specific stress reef habitat. The coral is devoting a significant amount of energy into calcifying and aragonite deficient waters. In the event of a major storm, individuals may be more susceptible to damage than if they were at full strength. Once the storm passes, corals are now attempting to calcify and to recover from new damages incurred. This weakness increases vulnerability to yet another disaster. As long as these destructive events continue, reef habitats will continue to grow increasingly susceptible to elimination. While large-scale dense have impact on corals, a steady decrease in coral calcification rates play a strong supporting role in the downfall of reef ecosystems. Since 1990, a 15 to 20% average decline in these rates has been observed. Weaker corals means greater damage to entire habitats in the event of disease or storms. Although the loss of coral reefs will yield negative implications for humans, as previously discussed, the impacts on other aquatic life should be anything but overlooked. Thousands of organisms find home in coral reefs. They will either have to relocate or perish in the event of reef disappearance. Zooxanthellae and marine invertebrates exist in a symbiotic relationship. A disappearance of the former would lead to decreased reproduction rates among the latter. Separately, the solar energy typically released by zooxanthellae will no longer be available to fish, coral, ovores, or invertebrates. Research in the past to help organize management plans for the Great Barrier Reef have tended to lack the depth required to make a lasting impact on the perpetuation of this ecosystem. Shifting baseline refers to the tendency for management goals to slip further from what was considered acceptable in the past to a decreased level of biodiversity in present day. For example, in Hawaii, scientists are attempting to reintroduce diadema into the local ecosystem. While this may seem substantial here and now, this effort is a far cry from the much more important historical disturbances in the past. In basic terms, it is more difficult to study what no longer exists. NTAs were historically designated to encompass the reefs most heavily impacted. While this isn't a poor practice, it gave managers false confidence that they were doing everything in their power and that the reefs were safe. We now know this to be far from reality. For proper protection and revitalization, attention must not be diverted from any specific habitats in lieu of NTA designation. Additionally, the NTAs that were historically implemented were often misplaced and tended to be far too small to make significance towards coral revitalization. On a landscape management level, conservation efforts will require the cooperation of people, especially those of the local populations who directly depend on the GBR. The success or failure of land management and natural resource decisions is often determined by the levels of collaboration and cooperation between conservation organizations and local people who are most directly affected. On an individual level, one of the most important things you can do is be informed. Be aware of the status of the Great Barrier Reef and its larger ecological importance. Economic motivations are often the drivers of environmental degradation, and the damage to the GBR is no exception. We need to be aware of the wider ramifications of our economic decisions on an individual level in order to enact change on larger scales. Decisions regarding the GBR may be largely up to the Australian government, but this doesn't mean that we in the U.S. can't express our concerns. We can write to Australian leaders, find out what conservation organizations are doing, and propose informed solutions. Species declines and coral losses in the GBR are ecological indicators which cannot be ignored. Societies and economies exist within ecological frameworks, therefore environmental destruction in the name of development is unsustainable. To continue receiving the ecological goods and services provided by the GBR, We need to step back and take a serious look at its value to society on a global scale.